Hey, what's up guys? You're now listening to Devo with Uncle Theo. Today is day 214, and we're gonna cover Isaiah chapters five through nine. Last time we left off, we set the stage for this book. We stated that the main point of this book is to tell us what God will do. And the two things that he will do is judgment, chapters one through 39, and salvation, chapters 40 through 66. And remember, this book is set up like a covenant legal case. Israel's back is against the wall. God has Israel on trial and Isaiah is letting them have it. But he sprinkled doses of hope all through his statements. He's saying, look, come, let us reason together. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are as crimson, they will be like wool. But he continues to indict them because they followed idols and the land is full of idols. And we got to get the land full of God's glory because that's the purpose of creation. That's where God that's where God wants to head. And so we pick up in chapter five and Isaiah comes on the scene and he says, look, I want to sing a song. And so that's what verse one says. Let me sing a song of my beloved, a song of my beloved concerning his vineyard. So now we're about to get a song by Isaiah. And if you know Isaiah well, you know that there's going to be a catch to this. But we need to set the stage for this. Isaiah says he wants to sing a song about vineyards. And something you need to know is that vineyards are very important in Israel's culture. They're a big deal at this time. In fact, they have name brand vineyards. In this text, it'll say choices vine. Look at verse two. He dug it all around, removed his stones and planted it with a choices vine. And so that would be like us saying a Shakita banana or Fuji apple or a Sunkiss orange. This is a name brand vine. It's called a Suric vine. And it says on top of that, he builds a tower for the vine. But there's a problem. This vine is supposed to be producing good fruit, good grapes, verse two, but it's only producing worthless grapes. The word in Hebrew there is boshin. It's unomatopoetic which means the word makes the sound. This fruit makes you want to vomit. Can you hear it? Bo Boshin. It looks like a grape, but it's not a grape. It's supposed to serve the purpose of a vineyard. And so this person has this vineyard. It's not serving its purpose. It's supposed to produce good fruit, but it's only producing vomit fruit. So think about Isaiah saying this song to Israel. They're like, what more could you have done for this vine? This is outrageous. Whoever is involved in this should be punished, tear it apart. But he ends it by saying, I will also charge the clouds to rain no rain on it. And you say, hold on, wait a minute. How can the vine keeper not make it rain? And now Isaiah comes out in verse seven. He says, who said I was speaking about a human? And who said that the vineyard was a real vineyard? The person, the friend is God. And the vineyard is you, Israel. You've just sang the song to your own death warrant. Isaiah uses the trick of Nathan with David. He tells a story and says, thou art the man. This is the same scheme. But think about this. Look at the theology that's built in John. Why do you think that Jesus can say, I am the true vine? Because he will undo all of this. Israel is a poor vineyard. Jesus is the correct vineyard. And this chapter makes sense because the fruit of the spirit in Galatians 5 produces what? It produces good fruit, not boshin, not vomit fruit. And so the Trinity is helping you to understand that they can help you produce the fruit that Israel never could. Isn't that good news? So God has Israel hemmed up and that moves us into chapter six. And this is not a scene in the present. It's like a vision in the end. Listen to this. In the year of King Isaiah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to the other and said, Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. A few things. One, you see that title high and lifted up that is only referred to the Lord in this book. I want you to grab a hold of that because when we get in the second half of this book, we're going to see this title referred to somebody else called the suffering servant. And that should get our attention because how can he have the same title as the Lord? And also, how can the whole earth be full of his glory? When it's now full of idols, who does Isaiah see on the throne? Who is holy? The Lord is holy, but this is not just speaking to God. This is speaking about Israel's state. The Lord can make that which is unholy, holy again. 
he can he can take a land filled with idols and make it fill with God's glory, which is why you see here, Isaiah says, when he sees this, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. And one of the seraphim flew with burning coal in his hand and touched his mouth. What is this? This is a picture of Israel. It's a microcosm of his message. What happens to Isaiah will happen to who? Will happen to Israel. His lips are touched and his iniquity is taken away and his sin is forgiven. This is a small picture of what will happen for all those who have their sins atoned for. And we're going to later learn that this atonement happens and is founded in the sacrifice of Christ. That moves us to chapter 7. Now in chapter 7 through 12, we're going to get prophecies about the Messiah. We're going to stop in chapter 9 today, but you see a prophecy here that we know about that comes up a lot during Christmas time. Verse 14, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with you, will be with child and bear a son and she will call his name Emmanuel. He will eat curds and honey, for the boy will know enough to refuse evil and choose good, the land whose two kings you will dread and forsake. And so remember the theology of the barren womb? God was getting you to focus on barren wounds because he always does something special with a womb, and he has the one up all of the barren wombs given birth by doing something even greater than that. How about a virgin birth? A virgin will be with, with child. So this one-ups Sarah, this one-ups Rachel, this one-ups Hannah, Samson, all of this is founded and this prophecy is fulfilled in Christ. And it says his name will be Emmanuel. And we knew that from earlier that he had to be of the fruit of heaven and of earth. And Emmanuel means God with us. So Isaiah is giving us new revelation. See, we didn't know this before. We knew something had to happen because when Josiah, as good as his life was, he loved God with all of his heart, soul, mind, and strength. It said that he couldn't do one thing, though. He couldn't stop the wrath of God. And that confused us because it made us say, oh, hold up, wait a minute. The king has to stop the wrath of God. Who can do this? And Isaiah is continuing that conversation. He's answering the question for us. Only God can do this. So this king is going to have to come from heaven. And he tells us how he'll come. He'll eat curds and honey. That's the diet of a poor man. So this person must be born in poverty. Why would he be born in poverty? To end poverty. He'll be born in darkness. Why would he be born in darkness? To end darkness. He'll be born in exile, have to flee to Egypt. Why would he be born in exile? To end exile. Because whom the sun sets free is free indeed. And so it's interesting as we move into chapter 8. We hear this funny name, Meir Shalahashbash. And this is a son that'll be born at this time. In verse three, by the prophetess, she will conceive and give birth. And so there's going to be a son born now in the exile to prophesy the captivity. But there also, but there is also going to be a future fulfillment where there will be a son born in the future who will end exile. And we wrap up today's reading in chapter 9. It says in verse 2 that the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. How? It's because Jesus will be born in darkness. Why? To break it, to end darkness. He breaks through darkness with light. He is born into exile to end exile. This is why the government will be on his shoulders because he will break exile. All the nations that took Israel into exile, the one that's coming will control all of that. No other nation will have power over him, which is why chapter 9, verse 6 made so much sense. For a child will be born to us, and a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace, and there will be no end to the increase of his government or peace and on the throne of David and over his kingdom. And so, guys, can you see why Isaiah is so important? And I know these verses are resonating with you, but Isaiah gives us so much light. This is the most light we've had so far. Isaiah is telling us that the person coming must not only be from the throne of David. He has to be God. We never heard this before. This is where we get our God man theology from. We would have never known this if Isaiah wouldn't have told us. And obviously the apostles developed this thought, but I want you to see the importance of Isaiah 
it develops our theology so well and so deep. And if you get Isaiah, you'll understand why it's one of the most quoted books in the New Testament, along with the book of Psalms. So let's continue to study it together and work through it chapter by chapter. You guys take care. Have a good day.